one third of all murder cases in America remain open. He had told me that if I opened my eyes, he would slit my throat. Each one is called a cold case. The DNA evidence taken from the victim was a match. The linen rapist was at it again. Based on the hit A&E television program. A phone call is placed. One that changes a family's life forever. Cold Case Files, the podcast. If you could see the fire in his eyes, he screamed at me. You want it? Get your tape recorder out. Get new episodes of Cold Case Files every Tuesday on Podcast One, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we talk cell phone pings. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my beaming co-host, Alice. Hi, Brett. Hi, Thank Alice. you for saying I'm beaming, and my beaming with just excitement to be back here with all of you to talk for another many hours about Adnan. Because you I are, am. and and you're beaming with excitement because, as amazing as it may seem, and some of you are actually going to miss us. You don't know it yet, but you're going to. We are closing in on the end of our coverage of this case. I know it's hard to believe. Impossible. And also... Episode 12, I think. In this episode 12? I have no idea. I lost count. When we hit the double digits, I lost count. But I also kind of like what's going on here, Brett. I think I'm picking up what you're throwing out there. Am I beaming kind of like a cell phone tower? Mm, Maybe a mm. little beaming ping? You don't even know that you are loving these puns. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love about you, Alice, is you can always find something. You can find some sort of <laughs> some sort of connection. But of course, that's what I meant. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Way to go, yeah. Brett. Way to go. Because actually, as maybe technical as it sounds, I love this stuff because there is a science to it. It's gotten better over time. It honestly hasn't changed that much since Adnan's case. You know, it's new. The cell phone pings, cell phone towers, all that technology was very new in Adnan's case. But honestly, it hasn't changed that much in the you know 20 years or so. And we practice this all the time and we have to put on experts. And so getting to read testimony in the trial back in Adnan is amazing to see how this is what we do every day, even now, and how it has evolved or really just been refined. And what's interesting about it, and we've talked about this some in the previous episodes, this really was one of the very first cases where this sort of cell phone information was used. And that's, you know... A unique aspect to this case and has added some complications and we're gonna talk about those today before we get started you know we're recording these as they're released because there's so many of them so people have been emailing in pointing out things to us that we got wrong and doing it in very sort of kind ways i would note we said in one of the early episodes that in the first letter that asia wrote that she spelled adnan's name correctly i'm going to blame the bourbon for seeing that extra line on the O and thinking it was an A in her handwritten letter, but it wasn't. She actually misspelled Adnan's name in the first letter too. So whatever significance it being spelled correctly in the first one and not in the second one, there is no significance because she misspelled them in both. We're going to talk about that a little bit here in a second, how that might actually be significant, but it wasn't significant in that way. And the other thing that was important, probably particularly to the doctor involved, we talked some about a medical examiner who did some lividity Uh, analysis on Hay's body and I think we've referred to them as a she so sorry sorry doc didn't mean to call you a he there to be totally honest well this is when we get case files and we like go by last names of everyone right the agents the law enforcement officers the experts the doctors I honestly like I, I like shim all of them i I don't even know because i'm calling everyone by their last names even when i'm prepping my own cases so if i said him 
Whoops. Never read a medical report and worry and thought, is this a man or a woman? Right? <laughs> it's just not, not really a significant thing, but I'm sure it's significant to, to that person. So sorry, Doc, if you're listening. You know, if you were not the one to complain, but just wanted to make sure that was accurate. Another thing, you know, because we're doing these live, occasionally we get requests from people to discuss a certain thing. And we got a request to discuss an affidavit by Jawan Gordon. We talked about Jawan Gordon several times over the course of these episodes. Jawan Gordon is described as Adnan's best non-Muslim friend. You may recall Jawan spoke to the police on several occasions. One of the things he spoke about was talking to Adnan and getting the impression that Adnan was going to have some girl in 12th grade Asia question mark write a letter for him but she got the address wrong and sent it to the wrong place and we pointed out oh and it was going to be a typed letter and we pointed out that the second letter by Asia fits a lot of those criteria it's got the wrong address on it it's a typed letter her name's Asia she was in 12th grade and the question was did Adnan provide for her some of the contents of that letter and somebody wanted us to talk about an affidavit that Jawan did because in 2016 this case became the subject of a post-conviction review hearing. And during that, Asia McLean was actually able to testify. And of course, one of the problems with her testimony with the letters was people had picked up on this. And, and there was a lot of concern that that was going to undermine her. So back in 2016, Jawan Gordon wrote a handwritten affidavit. And one of the things he says is an attempt to clarify this question. So he says, in my interview with police on 4999, I was not suggesting that Adnan or anyone did anything deceptive. I recall telling police that Adnan talked about asking Asia to write a character letter. He may have asked her by letter, just like he did with me and Justin. I do not know if he ever sent her the letter, nor do I know if she ever received it. And so the question is, is this affidavit that Jawan wrote sort of proof that that's not what happened with that second letter? And I think this is a really interesting affidavit because on the surface, it may seem like it, but when you look at it more, you realize that there's some problems here. The first one is the affidavit itself is 17 years later. It was done in 2016. So this conversation he had with police was in April of 1999 when he is telling the police the information he has received. Uh, number two, he says that Adnan mentioned character letters, but one has to wonder why would Adnan ask Asia, who doesn't even know how to spell his name, and in fact misspelled it in both letters, as we pointed out, to write a character letter for him. The other question, when would he have asked her? So maybe you think, well, he would have asked her after that first letter. So once he knew about the first letter, he might have thought, oh, she's willing to write a letter for me. I should ask her for a character letter. The problem is the second letter is dated March 2nd one day after the first letter. So there's no way Adnan could have received the letter, responded to it, asked her to write him a character letter, and that letter have been the letter in response to that request. The other, More problems. If the second letter came after he wrote Asia, why does Asia make a big deal about him writing to her to give her updates at the end of the second letter so she can tell people in school how he's doing? The way the second letter is written, it's pretty obvious that Adnan has not made any contact with her. The other question, why would he ask her for character letters at this stage of the prosecution? Remember, Jawan Gordon's interview with the police was April 9th, 1999. That's only a month after the Asia letters are dated. So you would have to believe that Adnan, that early in the process, in fact, mere days after he was arrested, is already asking people to write character letters for him. That's that's such that's such a good point, Brett, because, you know, character letters, people think about them and you have to think about it in context of the case progression. Character letters come way, 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 way later. They happen basically at trial and or sentencing. If you listen to our case progression episode in Legal Bruce, you know that so much happens before the character analysis comes in and it doesn't really matter in the legal parts leading up to trial. If this early in the investigation, this early on in everything, there is not really thought about character letters. You're thinking about witnesses, though, who can vouch for it because we have no resolution yet or no direction towards a resolution. So character letter would be incredibly jumping the gun. Yeah, I mean, character letters are for sentencing because a letter someone writes wouldn't even be admissible in the trial 
you, you wouldn't even you would not be able to admit that it's hearsay so the person would just have to testify so if you're actually asking for character letters it would come much later now maybe adnan didn't understand that though once again he is really on top of things <laughs> he's already asking people to write him character letters now some people have said this was for some sort of bail application and that's a possibility those do happen sometimes and maybe somebody's going to write some letters for that but i got to tell you when you're in jail for strangling your girlfriend the letters of some people from high school are not going to have much of an effect on whether or not you get bail or not so could this be what joan is remembering like that was the reason for the character letters and he's sort of just sticking this in there like well you know 17 years later, you're asking me, why would I have said this to the police? What would have been the non-nefarious reason? Well, I remember sort of vaguely some character letters, maybe for a bail hearing. And so that's what he says. Problem is, Asia never wrote any letters for any kind of bail hearing. So it doesn't even really work that way. So on the one hand, if it's character letters for trial or sentencing, it's way too early. If it's for a bail hearing, I mean, look, Adnan gets arrested at the end of February. The bail hearing would have been pretty close after that. I guess it's possible in March he's asking people for, for those letters, but one person he wouldn't have been asking for those letters is Asia McLean. The other problem is, it's not a character letter. I mean, we read the second letter to you. It's not about his character. It's not about how well she knows him and all this other stuff. It's about things that have to do with the case and her alibi and, and, and all these other things. But then the clincher for this affidavit, to me, the affidavit absolutely confirms that Adnan did this. Like, Jawan is repeating, I mean, he's changing the character, no pun intended, of the letter that Asia would have been asked to write, but he is reaffirming all these years later when asked by the defense team to give them an affidavit that they can use to try and get out of this box they're in, he's affirming, oh yeah, I mean, Adnan told me about writing a letter and getting Asia to write a letter, but you know, that was that was a character letter. And I'm not saying that Jawan is lying here. And the other thing, there's no reason, and we didn't say that the second letter is fake. You know, Jawan chooses his words pretty carefully. He says, Adnan never asked him to be deceitful, and he knows of no request for, by Adnan to make anything up. The second letter, the things we pointed out about it, are the citation to facts that would be helpful for Adnan and how that was interesting and how Asia went from being very sort of questioning of his innocence really asking him, look at me in the eyes. I need to sit down with you. I need to sit across from you. And you look me in the eyes and tell me you're innocent. And only then can I help you to literally the next day, writing as if she was his greatest supporter and laying out all this evidence in support of him. And look, I don't want to, you know, spend the rest of our time on this. It was just sort of a, an interesting sideshow. And we didn't spend a lot of time on Aisha's letter. So I thought we could give it a few more minutes. But this is something that's attracted a lot of attention and I would say if you're somebody who's really fascinated by these letters, we'll link to her testimony at that hearing. If you've never read Asia's testimony at the post-conviction review hearing, read it. In particular, read the cross-examination, in particular the second day of cross-examination, because the prosecutor just... I mean, she, she stays pretty strong, but he really points out all of these things. He goes through that letter. He points out all the things that... How would you have known this? If it was sent on March 2nd, it was sent a couple days after Adnan had been arrested. Only a few days after the car had been found. But she's saying things like, "How could? why did it take the police three days to find the car? She's talking about the exact theory of the case, about Adnan following somebody else in the car. She talks about fibers being found on Adnan's body. She points to all sorts of things that really that early, when you're just, we're still just shocked that your friend has been arrested, you wouldn't actually know that. And he goes through that. How did you know this? How did you know this? And she has no answer for it. He asks her several times, did you really write this later and, and backdate it? And she says no. And he goes through Juwan's statement. And is like, why would Juwan say this? And she has no real answer. And there was one, there was one thing in particular that really stood out to me. And I had not noticed this the first time I'd read it. But it reminded me of something Alice said. When we were talking about that second letter, we talked about... Why would she type up the letter and not handwrite it? Alice raised that point. If she handwrote the first letter and he sent her a letter, why not just handwrite it again? And it's a good question. I said, I don't know why she did that. All I know is it says the letter's going to be typed. Well, in her testimony, Asia actually says that she handwrote the letter first and then typed it. 
That's her testimony, that she wrote it out and then for reasons that she can't really explain, types it out and then sends it, which doesn't really make any sense. And particularly given that the first letter was handwritten, and I think just reinforces that Adnan had asked her to type out the letter. Don't know why he asked her to do that, but she did it. And this is such a great example of even though you have an affidavit here where it seems to be saying something as fact. I mean, it is his affidavit, sworn affidavit, but it doesn't mean you have to suspend all reasoning and all logical reasoning, all logical analysis and all logical questioning of what is written there. You know, everything that Brett just raised that's a problem with the 17 year later affidavit is a completely valid question to ask especially when it does it is not consistent with reality right it doesn't make any sense there are so many questions unanswered based on the secondary affidavit but one thing we know for sure is that 17 years ago Jawan said that adnan asked asia to write a letter he's still saying that here right strip away all of the stuff around it that's kind of what's important here and he confirms that yet again and it could be that everyone's memories are foggy 17 years later but i think it's everything we talked about with asia's first and second letter still kind of applies here the questions are still valid here especially with the dating of it especially with kind of the differences in how those two letters were conveyed and also the fact that asia took the stand and didn't have any answers to those questions about inconsistencies and why certain things happen. We're not saying that just because you handwrite a letter one time means you can never type another letter in your life. You always have to handwrite. That's not the point. But you're allowed to ask those questions. Why the difference one day later, especially when it was more work for you to have to go home and type the letter? And why didn't you do that first time? And when you have no answer for that, that is something to take into account. Yeah. And so it's one of those things where I maintain this isn't that important. I maintain that my position is still that Asia thinks she saw Adnan on that day. A lot of people disagree with that. I just don't think these letters are that important. I also think that Adnan probably asked her to write that second letter. I think that second letter wasn't written on March 2nd. I think it was written much later. And I think it included information that by that point in time, Adnan and and probably a lot of people had that they thought was helpful for him. And that's why it was in there. But if you are fascinated by this and you really care about this, don't take our word for it. Go and read Asia's own testimony under oath. It is available online. Read it, see what you think, see what you think about her explanation, and go from there. Much more significant than Asia's letters, whether she wrote them or when she wrote them or whatever, are the cell phone pings. We have been talking about cell phones (laughs) since the very beginning we talked about this. And the cell phones and the location data on the cell phones is probably the most controversial thing about this case. And you will hear people say that the cell phones are useless. You can't trust them. We've seen that. I mean, in response to our episodes, we have had people tweet at us, write at us, and say, why do you keep talking about cell phones? It's useless. You can't get anything from it. And and we've said from the beginning, that's not true. But we want to go through this in depth to figure out exactly what you can get out of the cell phone data. One thing you can definitely get, times, and if it's an outgoing call, who it was to. And, and that's important. Those are things that are important in figuring out any kind of timeline and and figuring out what exactly was going there, figuring out whether Adnan and Jay were alone or together. And that is information that I think no one questions. But what we're specifically going to talk about today is location. So this question of whether and to what extent the cell phone information when it comes to location is accurate in this case, it's become the heart of everything. It was in the motion to vacate the conviction. It's in every discussion of this case. And I think there is one thing to remember from the very beginning when it comes to this location data. Almost no one, and I'm sure there's someone, disputes that the location data for outgoing calls is accurate. There were a lot of outgoing calls that night. We walked through them in the timeline. If you want to be refreshed on that, if you listen to episode three and four, we talk a lot about the cell phone calls and we tell you when it's an outgoing call. Nobody disputes. Those are accurate. The location data for those are accurate. So doesn't mean that it's always accurate. You can have weird little things happen, but the general consensus is if you have location data for an outgoing call, that's going to be accurate for you. Many of the calls, including important ones, are outgoing. The two incoming calls that are most important are the two calls that ping the Lincoln 
Park Tower during the time when Jay Wiles has said that he and Adnan were burying Hayes' body there. Now, as we noted before, the testimony at trial involving the cell phones was pretty damning with Abe Warwanowitz. And we're just going to call him Abe from now on, which is what they did, <laughs> by the way, in the PCR. They just went, they just started calling him Abe, which I, I thought was great. I actually love that because never do you use their first name. Never. <laughs> they pretty much were like, we can't, we can't do this anymore. Yeah, I felt justified in the fact that nobody else could pronounce his name either. So we're going with Abe. So Abe testified that the cell phone could be tracked across the city, seemingly confirming the story Jay Wilds told. And I think they even had a demonstrative where every time they had a call, they would put it on the map and they sort of showed you could just follow the path of the cell phone everywhere it was supposed to be. But in the years that followed, people noticed a disclaimer on the cover sheet AT&T sent along with the records. So AT&T faxes these records over. And they include a bunch of different documents, but one of the documents is a cover sheet. And it says how to read subscriber activity reports. And it gives you, and I'll just read you the whole thing. Please note, all call times are recorded in Eastern Standard Time. So sorry for those of you <laughs> who can't do time zones. <laughs> Not going to dwell on that. Top codes are defined as the following. INT equals outgoing long distance call, LCL, outgoing local call, CFO, call forwarding, SP, special feature, INC, incoming call. When SP is noted in the type column and then the dialed hashtag number sign column shows number and the target phone number, for instance, hashtag number, now I'm calling it a hashtag. I'm sorry, like I'm I have some to sort stop you for a second. I was going to say, the fact that you're calling it a hashtag shows you you're not operating the time of add-on because it's hashtag now with Twitter days, but that's totally a pound sign. It's a pound <laughs> sign. Okay, fine. Pound sign for you kids. Phone number. This is an incoming call that was not answered and then forward to voicemail. The preceding row, which is an incoming call, will also indicate CFO in the feature column. Here's the important line, but it's also important to read all that for reasons that will become evident soon. Outgoing calls only, and this is underlined, are reliable for location status. So important thing, this document that everybody focus on tells you straight out, outgoing calls are reliable for location status. However, any incoming calls will not, and not's in all caps, be considered reliable information for location. Then it says blacked out areas on the report. If any are cell site locations, which need a court order signed by a judge in order for us to provide. So that is the cover letter and that warning, which nobody noticed. Abe said he never saw. Nobody really focused on really until serial came around has become the focus of a lot of attention in this case, particularly on those incoming calls that happened in Leakin Park when Hayes body was supposedly being buried. All right. So with that, the defense called its expert, Jerry Grant, and he had testified seven times before as an expert and had training in cell site analysis. He had testified for the defense in the Boston bomber case. And unsurprisingly, the defense focused on the language of the facts cover sheet. Grant testified that if the cover sheet told him that incoming calls were not reliable for location, he would not use incoming calls for location. He said his next step would be to ask for more clarification on what the document meant. And he confirmed that from his discussions with Abe, he had not noticed these instructions. And so kind of like what Brett said, this was not something that he had ever seen before, because honestly, we get a lot of these cell phone subpoena records and they, they typically do have like a key of how to read things. They're pretty much all the same, but you don't really read the, the cover sheet in much detail. And so it doesn't surprise me that even though Jerry Grant is a, an expert in cell site analysis, that he's not like pouring over the cover sheet of this record in particular, because he's he is knowledgeable not just about these specific the specific companies cell site records. He is an expert in all cell site analysis, right, across the board. Now, that was pretty much it on direct. That's basically all they covered. And there was no attack at this point on outgoing calls at all. No attack on the drive test itself, just the two incoming calls that put the phone in Leakin Park. 
on cross-examination, Grant acknowledged he'd never seen this kind of attack on cell phone data before. And Grant speculated that this was a result of very old technology and that as upgrades were made, the error actually went away so that this warning was something of the past. And although it had been noted that Abe only did outgoing calls, on cross-examination, Grant admitted that the only time he'd done test calls in a case, he also only did outgoing calls. Now, Grant also acknowledged that the only person he spoke to at AT AT&T was Abe. And the only explanation Grant had for why location might be inaccurate is it might reflect the location of of the person making the call and not the person calling. But Grant couldn't really explain why that would happen or what would lead him to believe that. So basically, he's just trying to come up with an answer. And he doesn't No, he can't really give an answer. Like if you're using the same device, cell phone, and you're using the same towers and the pings are happening in the same way when you're making calls and receiving calls, he couldn't even explain, though he's an expert, why one set of calls, the outgoing calls, are accurate for location, but incoming is not. And this was so interesting to me because on the one hand, you know, when you read the description of this testimony particularly from sort of ad non friendly sources. They'll say things like they destroy the cell phone evidence. And and they say that, I mean, look, he gets up and says the code says not reliable for location data. So I wouldn't have relied on it for location data. That's pretty good testimony. <laughs> you know, that's, that's pretty straightforward. And it's the kind of testimony that you as a layperson can kind of understand. He doesn't have to go through a bunch of sort of like how cell phones work and, you know, what magic happens when they connect to a tower. He's just like, hey, instructions. Instructions say don't use it, so I'm not going to use it. But what's interesting about it is that's almost the reason that it's problematic. Because no one can really explain why this is true. It doesn't actually make sense for these guys. And and he doesn't say that, that it doesn't make sense, but he acknowledges, like, look, never seen this attack before. <laughs> like, this is this is something I've never seen happen. And, and I'm an expert. <laughs> yeah, I'm an expert. I've been, I've been doing this for a long time. Never seen this before. Never seen an attack that somehow an outgoing call and an incoming call would be different. And the only thing I got for you is maybe maybe it's showing where the person's call from. There's an interesting problem here that I feel like people never point out. Imagine for a second he's right. Imagine that he nailed it. The reason the incoming calls are problematic is because they show where the person calling you is, not where you are. Well, that would mean somebody called Adnan's cell phone from Leakin Park at the time that Hayes' body is being buried. Right? I mean, that doesn't make sense unless you think... Somehow, like, what exactly is going on there, right? I mean, we know the story Jay told is that it was Jen calling, that Jen called twice to sort of figure out this weird page, and that kind of fits with the calls because there were outgoing pages, and then she calls. But we don't actually know that it's Jen because we don't know the incoming calls like we do the outgoing calls. So what does that mean? If somebody is calling Adnan from Leakin Park that night where her body ends up, isn't that in crematory as well? I mean, maybe he isn't that kind of worse in some way. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how that makes it. I, I mean, I guess it's I don't think better, it helps him, <laughs> and it undermines Jay's story because Jay's saying, "No, we were in Leakin Park," but it's certainly still a problem for him, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't because want... her body is still in Leakin yeah. Park, and why <laughs> is Adnan being called while the person is supposedly burying her body in the park? Yeah, and so. <laughs> So then like your mind, and we've been trying to stay out of these rabbit holes, right? But then your mind sort of runs crazy. Well, if the defense expert's right, what about Bilal? <laughs> like, you know, then you like come back to Bilal all of a sudden and his, all his cell phones. And, and is he somehow involved? And here's one way, and that's an interesting question that we'll get to later. But here, here's another thing that you can test the data with. Typically, obviously, they live, you know, in this area. They may not have a lot of friends outside of the Leakin Park area, the Baltimore area. But there's an easy way to look at the data to see whether his theory is correct, right? If you think that the reason location data is not accurate, first of all, you wouldn't say in the cover sheet that the incoming call data is not reliable, right? It would just say 
it's not used for this purpose. It's not that because his theory is it's very reliable. It's just reliable for somebody else. And then you would be able to look down the list of calls and see something like an outgoing call is in a certain location. And then an incoming call is in a location that is impossible time wise to have gotten there if you were if it was the same person receiving the call. Right. But you don't see that here. We have kind of none of that time difficulty. And we're able to see this like we we would get cell phone records all the time for different cases we have. And sometimes there's not a key as to tell us how this particular cell phone company keeps their records. Is it the incoming call, the caller's location or is it the callee's location? And we don't know that. But as we're looking through the records, we can kind of suss it out by looking at where the locations are here. And so the fact that all of these calls are in the same place, it doesn't seem like his theory really can pan out, that it's the location of the caller rather than the person you're calling, which is Adnan's phone. And look, so that's the defense expert. That's what he says. That's his testimony. And that's his guess. I mean, his testimony really hinges on this 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 sheet that it says it's not reliable, so it's not reliable, really shouldn't rely on it. Well, after he testifies, then Special Agent Chad Fitzgerald testifies and Fitzgerald he's called by the state to talk about cell phones he is an FBI agent he is also an engineer who worked on communication satellites before he became an agent so you know smarter guy than I am he is a member of the cellular analysis survey team or cast which is the premier experts in cell analysis in fact he helped set up this team of FBI agents who Alice and I have worked with them they go around the country and they do this kind of stuff, right? I mean, they work on this kind of stuff, and they are the people who are going to testify. They're the ones who are going to testify in these cases. In any, in any case involving cell phones, if you can get a cast agent to testify, that's who you want. And they also train a lot of people. So even if you have somebody who's a local or a state person who's testifying, they were probably trained by cast and Fitzgerald he'd been working with cell phone analysis since 1998 and he testified around 50 times in federal court and he had worked on many high profile cases including the Boston Marathon bombing which is interesting because the defense attorney also worked on that case and he was asked about you know how did Abe do in his his work and he said quote did a very good fairly thorough you know pretty much about as thorough as you can get short of one little step maybe half a step and you know especially for 1999 I thought it was good. Now, they also had Fitzgerald do an independent analysis of the cell records, and he was asked, based on your independent analysis of the call detail records that were presented at the trial, did you find that any of the tower locations with effect to any of the phone calls were improperly or inaccurately represented by Mr. Warwanowitz? He says, I did not. Not a single one. No. Incoming calls, outgoing calls, any distinction between them in his analysis? No. I didn't see any errors as far as the cell site is. With respect to what your testimony would be or would have been as to what towers were being used by what phone call corresponding to Mr. Syed's January 13th calls, do you agree to the same conclusions today? Yes. So basically Fitzgerald's position was, hey, I looked at the data. I looked at the cell side information. I compared the two. I think they're accurate. I don't see a distinction between incoming calls and outgoing calls. And if I did the exact same analysis he did at the time, I would have came to the exact same conclusion that he came to. Now, the government then asked about the information on the AT&T cover sheet that we've been talking about so far. And Fitzgerald explained that there are two types of records provided by AT&T that were later converted into Exhibits 5 and 6 by the government. Now, Exhibit 6 was the call detail record with the data for which tower and sector was pinged by the phone, the kind of record you could use to then extrapolate location. Exhibit 5 was a document with other additional information about the subscriber activity, including a column entitled Location. The government had Fitzgerald highlight everywhere that the notations on the fax cover sheet were present. They were all over Exhibit 5, but they did not appear on Exhibit 6. Exhibit 5 had a location column, and Exhibit 6 did not. So in order to figure out the location from Exhibit 6, one would need to do actual cell site analysis rather than just read the location off the page. Exhibit 5 essentially had rough location information, which Fitzgerald speculated was based on the cellular switch used that was not reliable for incoming calls. In this case, it's not even clear that's true, as there was only one switch at the time for the area, but 
That's what Fitzgerald said. Now, Exhibit 6 was a different story altogether. Fitzgerald concluded that the facts cover sheet referred to the subscriber activity report, not the call detail record. And Fitzgerald explained, just reading, I mean, it seems to me it's fairly logical. You read the key, you can match everything up that's being talked about onto the report, the state's Exhibit 5. You can't match up what's being talked about on anything, really, on six. That's incredibly important. When you're given a key, of course, you're going to use the key for a certain document. He's saying this key maps onto what you see on Exhibit 5, but not on Exhibit 6. But Fitzgerald didn't stop there. He also talked to people at AT AT&T about it, which would seem to be a smart thing to do. And here's that testimony. Now, you have had the opportunity to talk with individuals that work for these cell phone companies, AT&T at the time, as well as more recently, as your conclusion. Yes, in the last month, I've talked to my contacts at AT AT&T and the subpoena compliance group. And they, in turn, found people that were working back then to kind of review it in their group at AT AT&T, as well as I with AT&T, like I say, earlier this week, and we briefly discussed it with the guys that showed up there, too. Question, and is it your conclusion to the court, consistent with your conversations with those individuals at AT AT&T, both more recently, as well as individuals who were working at AT AT&T in 1999? Well, to be fair, I didn't specifically say, you know, let's go through the entire subscriber activity report key and compare it to this. We just talked about why that sentence would have been on the subscriber activity report and kind of logically why we thought it would be on there. Was anything that they shared with you inconsistent with your conclusion? No. And didn't you, is this consistent with your memory of your work in 1999 as to the incoming calls and blacked out columns and what was happening at the time of the cell phone records and cell phone tower analysis? I believe that what they're referring to still happens today with some of the providers. Question. Special Agent Fitzgerald, this reference to location information not being reliable for incoming calls. Do you know, based on your experience, your training, your conversations, why it is that qualification is included on the facts cover sheet? I believe I do. Yes. Could you tell the court why that is? Well, I think the best way to explain it is through an example. So whenever, so my phone in my pocket is provisioned for the Atlanta switch since I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. So my phone is provisioned for the Atlanta switch. Any incoming call that comes in, if you dialed my phone right now, it's going to have to be handled by the Atlanta switch. It's going to be routed down to the Atlanta switch. If I'm on the network and they realize I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, the phone call will then get transferred up to Baltimore, Maryland, out through a cell site into my phone. If I never powered up my phone or was off the network and you tried to make the same call, because these call records and some call records still do it today, where they capture every leg of the call, if I was off network, it would show that call going down to the Atlanta switch and being handled by the Atlanta switch and then going to the voicemail platform. And if it was handled by the Atlanta switch and I'm in Baltimore, that does not mean that you would see the Atlanta switch on the report and that does not mean that I'm in Atlanta. I'm actually physically in Baltimore. I just wasn't on network. And and this makes sense if you think about the difference between an incoming call and an outgoing call. You can't make an outgoing call without turning on your phone. And when you turn on your phone, it's going to align with whatever switch it's on. And so that would make sense that then that location data that's showing up on that one report would be more accurate. Whereas since the phone, the phone company can't know whether your phone was on or not when the phone calls come through. So if there's incoming calls, the phone company can't say this is going to be accurate because they can't tell you what the status of your phone was. They can't tell you what switch it was connected to, whether it was on network. They can't tell you any of that stuff because they don't know. So it makes sense that they would have that caveat. And I would just say, Alice and I have done cell phone records where we use this kind of location data. And when you use this kind of location data, you're not doing cell phone tower analysis you're not doing the sectors you're not doing the towers you're literally just using sort of the cheat location they give you it often is not exhibit five <laughs> basically exhibit five we have used this in a case and we had to explain as we were going through with the expert when it says this guy's in this town he's not there right and the guy would say no he's not there that's his home location and so when he's getting that incoming call it's still showing his home location Didn't say it was because the phone was off, but that was sort of the explanation. So we've literally seen this happen before. But if we had taken those same records and we had used the cell site data location, we could have narrowed it down to exactly where he was. We didn't need that. We just needed very general location information. But we saw this same kind of flaw in that very specific kind of cell phone data that Fitzgerald is talking about. 
Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take. Whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality, it can be hard just to know where to start. But now, all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. And Alice, you can turn to Angie with confidence no matter what the size of your home or the size of your project. Whether you've got a 100-year-old house like I do or it seems like things are always breaking or if you're renting and you're needing someone to help you with moving moving, installations, or cleaning, Angie is there for you, and they're there for you with confidence. So, Angie has over 20 years of home service experience, and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with Angie's app, answer a few questions, and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or, they can help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps because when it comes to getting the most out of your home you can do this when you angie that download the free angie mobile app today or visit angie.com that's a-n-g-i.com check them out today angie.com a-n-g-i.com before we move on, we are so excited about one of our favorite sponsors, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. We always talk about how we're running from soccer practice to law jobs, court dates. It's really hard to think about meal planning and to go to the grocery store and make that actual meal to feed your family, but not with HelloFresh. And with fall right around the corner, and HelloFresh is here to help you plan for the busy season ahead. With tasty dishes delivered to your door, simply choose your recipes and pick your delivery date. Then lay back and enjoy the last days of summer, knowing dinner is covered. And the key to dinner time success, at least in my house, it's variety. And HelloFresh keeps your taste buds on their toes with 40 chef-crafted recipes to select from every week. From family-friendly to fit and wholesome, you'll always find new and exciting recipes to try and love. Yeah, Alice, and I know variety is important, and with HelloFresh, you can get all the recipes you want, but I have to say, I always have to mention them, because they are so amazing. Firecracker meatballs. The day the HelloFresh arrives on my door is the best day of the week because I know we're going to have firecracker meatballs at least once, but also a couple other recipes that I love as much as well. We are not kidding with you. We love HelloFresh, and you're going to love them too. So go to HelloFresh.com slash 50TP and use code 50TP for 50% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50TP and use code 50TP for 50% off plus free shipping. And you will find out for yourself why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting. And while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy. Like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you. Even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. By the way, Fitzgerald is an awesome example of a really good expert, right? He just described in layman's terms a very complex situation, actually, that previous experts couldn't explain. And this is 
exactly why he's kind of one of the best in the nation. There's only so many people who are part of cast and have this type of training. And of course, he has the hindsight of the years of cell site analysis behind him to be able to testify about this. But his own explanation of his phone and being registered in the Atlanta switch is it, it makes complete sense to me and a complete sense why there would be that explanation in the cover sheet. And it's completely plausible. Now, Fitzgerald said he'd never actually seen the attack on cell phone analysis that incoming calls are less reliable than outgoing calls. And he knew of no such attack in any of the cases his team ever testified in. And that makes sense, right? When you understand kind of his explanation as to why the cover sheet would have the qualifier, because the qualifier is kind of vague, but he's extrapolating what he thinks that qualifier is made for. It's just, it's too broad to actually explain that it's not that it's not not reliable. It's that there are situations that the phone company cannot possibly know for. And that's why he's saying he's never seen this type of an attack on cell phone analysis. Fitzgerald further testified that he spoke with AT&T engineers and they agreed with him that the instructions did not apply to the cell call detail records. On cross-examination, the defense spent quite a bit of time on the one thing Fitzgerald thought Abe got wrong. One call that went to voicemail. Abe thought it was checking voicemail, while Fitzgerald actually thought it was a call going to voicemail. Eventually, the government objected to this on relevance grounds, and this objection led to a lengthy sidebar. Eventually, the judge does allow this questioning, but he limits it. And let me just say, so this might have been out there somewhere, this transcript. I could never find it, so I just went to the Baltimore court and pulled it. So we have it. So if it, is, if it exists out there in the world, great. If it doesn't, well, whether it exists or not, we're going to put it on the website so you can read it. I was shocked, <laughs> both in this, in this transcript and in some of the other transcripts from this, about the just visceral hatred between the prosecution and the defense. I mean, these two lawyers hated each other and they were rude and they were inappropriate and the judge completely lost control of everything it was bizarre and these sidebars would just happen over and over again and they'd go up there and one of them would make some catty remark and the other one would demand that they retract it and it was just like which like you don't uh, do in court right nothing's actually retracted because it's not for like it's not an evidentiary thing so like i you know retract the fact that you called me a jerk like it doesn't really matter and so it's completely for personal emotional reasons which is unprofessional and not how you're supposed to act as a lawyer in court yeah it was wild it was wild and and this was was part of it when they're going back and forth on this call you know they're the pros the prosecution guy is basically like why do you keep asking about this like you've you've made your point let's move on and the other guy's like no i want him to admit that abe testified incorrectly i mean that was this whole thing like if i can get him to admit he testified incorrectly on this one point then maybe that blows up the whole thing and so they spent a whole lot of time on this and i'm sitting there thinking can we just get back to whether or not the the incoming the outgoing calls are accurate because that's what i'm interested in but they spent so much time on this voicemail yeah that's you know that that does happen sometimes when your emotions get the better of you which it shouldn't. Fitzgerald continues to explain to the defense that location data based on the switch can be flawed, especially, as he has said, for incoming calls. If someone powers off their phone in one switch and then moves to the next, incoming calls will ping as the original switch. But the cell site would not because the tower data would be correct. So the question was, well, isn't it also possible that location actually refers to the site? They're the location where the phone is. And Fitzgerald said it absolutely does not. The switch is just like on your drawing. There are switches connected to hundreds, if not thousands of towers. They could be anywhere within that region where that switch covers, just like your drawing showed all the spider web of towers coming off of there. If all I knew was the switch, I wouldn't know which direction on your paper the person would be. It'd just be in that the call got to that part of the switch, never making it out to a tower to provide actual location of the phone. After this, Fitzgerald points out that the defense had handed him a document labeled January 13th that was apparently not from that day in an effort to throw him off. 
quote. So they cut off the date and the initial time and left the terminating time and asked me specifically to find the call based on the terminating time. They did not leave the initial time on there. So the call is, you can't find the call on here because there's no call at 804 because they cut off that time, whether purpose or on accident. And this is the end of this being a useful, useful (laughs) exercise, because from that point forward, Fitzgerald is just enraged. (laughs) He is enraged. (laughs) Which you should be, right? Because you, he's an expert. He's not for any, he's not supposed to be for any side. He's just an expert. And to try and pull something like this, where you are showing a document that has incomplete information is infuriating when you're a professional, because it is completely dishonest. Now, of course, this is a pretty big allegation, right? He's saying you're trying to trick me and you're being dishonest. The right answer is not on this page on purpose. I can't answer your question because you've cut out the right answer. Now, the defense, of course, claimed that this was a simple mistake, but the government also noted that it had never been provided the document in question big no-no, by the way. The defense responded, quote, I think we added it at the last minute. We probably forgot to disclose it to you. You can't do that. You can't pull out a gotcha document in court for the very first time and not have disclosed it to the other side. And the defense here is saying, whoops, we didn't. But it was a mistake. It wasn't on purpose. Now, this led, as you can imagine, to an extensive back and forth that continued through the rest of that day and into the next day with the defense attorney on the defensive while Fitzgerald accused him from the stand of trying to manipulate evidence. This is not good. <laughs> this has nothing to do about the case anymore. This is a, a fight that's happening on the record under oath. And to be honest, from the questions by the defense attorney, I think he was right. I think the defense intended to have him say some things and then reveal that he was reaching conclusions based on a different day's information than the day of the murder. This obviously would have undermined Fitzgerald's testimony. But the defense's continuing questions seem to confirm that. And repeatedly, the defense asks Fitzgerald the following question. Because they're on a one-track mind. Like, they, they had a plan that they were going to do, and it just it went haywire. The defense kept asking, this is the st- scenario. You only have that document. You don't have your preferred version of it. You only have the one that I gave to you that doesn't have dates on it, and it doesn't have times on it. Can you fully read and understand that document, yes or no? For example, if I ask you, tell me about the call to the court on this date, could you look that up and understand it from that document? Now, this question appears to be an effort to salvage whatever the defense was trying to get out of providing the wrong document to Fitzgerald. This led to objections and more sidebars, along with Fitzgerald essentially refusing to answer the defense's questions, instead taking the opportunity to point out exactly what he believed they were doing. This is like... As a lawyer, your worst nightmare when your strategy is so apparent that you're called out by the witness, in this case, the expert witness. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just everything's going completely off the rails at this point. And the defense is trying to salvage things, arguing that this cutoff copy was actually the copy from Gutierrez's file, saying essentially, if this was all she had, then how could she possibly have cross-examined the expert? See... She was either ineffective or maybe this is what the prosecution gave her. And they were really the ones sandbagging her. The problem with that argument is it's inconsistent with what the defense had earlier asserted that this was just a copying mistake on their part. And that, you know, they probably just forgot to turn it over (laughs) or whatever. And this led to yet more arguments about which version was in evidence, what exactly was going on here, more sidebars with them yelling at each other, the two attorneys yelling at each other. I remember... If, they can't, if they're now switching the story and saying it was all Gutierrez had, they're the ones who haven't disclosed this copy to the prosecution. Because the, the way the argument would work if Gutierrez had this copy is that she was provided basically a cutoff document from the prosecution. But the prosecution is like, we've never seen this. You haven't given it to us. The judge completely lost control of this. He struggled to main control the whole time. And honestly, I kind of think this whole mess was beneficial to the defense because it distracted from the questions about the cell site evidence itself. So much time was spent on things other than cell site evidence, on what the technology is, what sort of the science. Like No one ever explained the science of why signals, you know, if you had a cell phone that was on, that wasn't moving quickly, that you hadn't left off while it was in another 
sale that wasn't blocked by a mountain or anything else, if you had that standing in one place and you made a call versus you had an incoming call, what is the science about why one of them is accurate and one of them isn't? And no one ever actually explained that. They never explained the science behind why that would be. And honestly, it may just be that there isn't any science behind it. I mean, basically... The defense's expert's argument was the instructions say so, and it was a long time ago. So maybe there's something we don't understand. I mean, it was basically like the instructions say so, so therefore I assume there's something we don't understand about the way the technology worked then, and that's why this would have happened. And then the prosecution guy was like, look, there is no reason for this to happen other than the one I'm giving you, and it's not a mystery. The instructions don't refer to what you think it refers to. And oh, by the way, unlike you, I talked to AT&T people who agreed with me on this. Like we can't go back 18 years and talk to somebody who was working there at the time and explain, you know, why this is, this works the way it did. And there's a couple things that are important to remember. One of them we've already mentioned, outgoing calls are absolutely like, you can't say that the cell phone records are worthless. You just can't say that. The outgoing calls absolutely are accurate. That's just a fact. And the other thing is the drive test is really important. So Abe did a drive test. And why is that important? Because it is not necessarily the case, and Fitzgerald goes through this in his testimony a little bit, and I think even the defense expert did as well. It is not necessarily the case that the closest tower is going to have the strongest signal. Instead... And, and therefore, that it won't necessarily be the closest tower that's going to be the one that connects. Instead, it's going to be a lot of things go into that. Line of sight's a big one. Line of sight tends to be important. If you don't have any obstructions between you and the tower, you're going to have a stronger signal. And so one thing Abe did is he went to all these locations and he made a call. And in making the call, he was able to confirm that the towers that they believed the phone was connected to were indeed the towers that they would connect to in those locations. And so he's able to say, yeah, OK, so when we when we plot this out, I'm not only looking at the records, I'm also doing a drive test to confirm that these are the same. Now, he's doing outgoing calls. And this was an interesting part about the cross-examination that, that Alice talked about. Because one thing we even said is, man, it's too bad he didn't do some incoming calls while he was sitting in Lincoln Park. Just do some incoming calls to confirm that that's what would happen with the incoming call. He only did outgoing calls. But once again, even the defense expert was like, yeah, when I, when I do that, I also just do outgoing calls. I don't do, I don't do incoming calls. Because once again, unless there's something quirky we just don't understand, it shouldn't be a difference. And I have, you know, I've done several of these cast trainings. I've talked to cast people about this. And I'm always like, so is there a difference between incoming and outgoing calls? And they're always like, no, that's what are you talking about? Right. And we've used this type of data in a lot of our cases. And we've, I've never seen that kind of an attack, just like Fitzgerald is saying in court. They're try, they try to attack all the cell phone data in general, but there's no like difference between the incoming and the outco- outgoing call that I've ever heard articulated in a convincing or in any manner, really, in the cases that I've used cell site records. That's the thing. You really need to be able to undermine the drive test and that data. You really need to be able to show that, like, for instance, that tower that we keep talking about isn't actually the one you would ping to in Leakin Park that the fact that we think it's that tower in that sector, you're actually wrong. If you'd been in Leakin Park that night, it would have it would have pinged to this tower. So that's wrong. That information is is misleading to you, but that's not something that happens. And it's just it was really interesting to me in actually looking at the testimony how much more narrow everything was. Even A. Bowarowitz, who we talked about before, all he said was, if I had seen this, I would have talked to people in AT and T to figure out what it meant. This is kind of like, we've talked about this a couple times. You know, if, for instance, they had nailed down the Asia question in 1999, if they had talked to Christy Vinson in 1999 about her class schedule, if someone had talked to the engineers in 1999 about what this meant, it's just as likely this wouldn't be an issue, that it would have been explained away. And the only reason, actually, it remains an issue is because now we're all just speculating about it. But the thing that was interesting to me was, even today, no one can really lay out for me why it would be that those incoming calls are not reliable other than 
the the key and i not look the key is valuable it's a great piece of evidence the defense does a really good job relying on it if you think that is universal if you think that sheet is for everything that like under no circumstances should you ever use incoming calls for location then you've got a problem with the incoming calls you know then they're not ironclad or anything that you still get value from them because you know for instance you know there are two calls that coincide with when jen pusateri said she called the cell phone and talked to adnan and was told you know jay will call you back like that is a helpful piece of information but you don't have the then connection that also the location puts them in leakin park at the same time that's a missing piece of evidence you wouldn't have. It's not necessarily definitive, but it's a weaker case for the prosecution if you can't tie those two calls together. Because having her, obviously, having her call Adnan, thinking she's calling Jay, talk to Adnan, he says, I'll call you back later, and that call happened while he's standing in Lincoln Park, that's pretty much a slam dunk, right? I mean, if you can confirm that happened, I don't even know why we're having any of these discussions. We didn't need 14 episodes. We would have needed five minutes. So, so you can take that out and it's a weaker case, but it's not a slam dunk that he's innocent. But if you put it in, then, then you got a problem. Then you got a pretty big problem. So in addition to this, there's also, I, I want to throw out one little piece of speculation because I did talk to somebody who is more of an expert in this than I am. And there's some interesting history about this technology. So according to a cellular engineer, so somebody who works in this area and worked in this area in the 90s prior to 1998 and more or less for the entirety of the 1990s AT&T employed a network technology called cellular one and this is just what this person told me I have no idea if any of this is true but I'm throwing it out there for all you guys to know so 1998 and back and it operated at much lower frequencies than what they eventually rolled out in the middle through the end of 1998 which is the PCS network and the PCS network was revolutionary and it basically it changed everything about cell phones and how they work and this person I spoke to speculated that the data sheets discussion of cell accuracy likely referred to the cellular one technology and not PCS and that when the expert was driving around the neighborhood doing the test calls he's on the PCS network it's later it's now in 1999 when they have you know they have rolled this out by the end of 1998 so even though there's still that artifact on the AT&T data sheet that the technology itself would have been updated so he's driving around the neighborhoods he's using PCS and he's getting sort of that modern call data information and in fact Shortly after Adnan's case, apparently AT&T actually removed the language about incoming calls from cover sheets, such as the one at play here. So it no longer said that. It no longer said location data or incoming calls are not reliable for location data. At that point, it was everything. And so this is just sort of one of those questions that's really difficult to answer. It is possible that the data sheets are tied to old technology that by the time of the murder no longer would have been in effect. So you're looking at the data sheet, the old instructions essentially, which are telling you, hey, our old technology, you couldn't do this, but we're not using the old technology anymore. I thought that was an interesting little factoid that this person shared with me. I mean, it's speculative. I'm not a cellular engineer. I have no idea how accurate that is, but I thought it was interesting. So I wanted to share it with everybody as well. Yeah, funny enough, I, I am not a cell phone expert either, but my dad actually worked for AT&T at this time and was part of the PCS network rollout. And if I remember correctly, it was at the about the end of 1998 because that's what precipitated my family's move. That's why it stands huh. out in my mind as the date. What a small uh, world. <laughs> what a, a literal small world. <laughs> and he still works for AT&T. Well, I guess they've changed names multiple times throughout the years as they, as they have been bought and sold and merged. But I think that's really interesting because with these network rollouts, they're all new. Everything is cutting edge, right? And you can imagine to cover yourself. And we see this all the time where records are not cover sheets, especially for subpoenas, will not be updated because you haven't tested out that network long enough. Or honestly, administratively, people just didn't go back and look at the sheet that goes along with every single record. We have caught those types of errors in cover sheets for 
many bank records that I've gotten back because the bank always says something about the way they do wires. But in fact, they have changed the way that they institute wires. And I've had to call the bank custodial custodian of records and said, you know, your cover sheet says this about the way you do wires. But my understanding, because we've actually, you know, had you guys on the stand for a trial before that this practice has ended. And they're like, oh, that's an old sheet. We never update those. So I've actually had the experience where old information or old instructions have been included for like years, maybe even a decade or longer, because no one actually reads those instruction sheets. What's important is actually to get the the testifier on the stand to explain those records. Because you as the attorney, you're not going to read the records. You can't read the records. You have to call the custodian records in order to get those records in or to have someone from the the keeper of the records to explain those records to you. And so it doesn't surprise me that maybe this was never caught before, that AT&T maybe never even realized that they still had old instructions on there. And maybe this highlighted it. And they went back and looked at it and thought, you know, it doesn't really apply anymore because the people who respond to the subpoenas are not the people who are rolling out the new networks. That's another thing, right? They're kind of different parts of the company. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good point. And I think sometimes people talk about this case, like it's in some sort of weird bubble and not the reality of the world and the way it works. And these things are, are questionable. And, you know, maybe you think, well, I can't be sure that's reasonable doubt and and therefore I shouldn't rely on it. But I think sort of wrapping this up, I think there are a few things that are absolutely undisputed. I think they're undisputed. I'm going to put them out there so people can dispute them. The first thing is it look, y'all can all debate this until the end of time on forums and we can all pile experts onto Reddit and let them go at it. But as far as what has been testified to in a court of law under oath, following a examination to determine whether someone is an expert sufficient that they can testify as an expert and be qualified as an expert. No one can say with any specificity why it would be that good for outgoing calls for location data, not good for incoming calls. The best we have is some speculation about how it might show the person who's calling and not the person who's coming in. And by the way, Fitzgerald said, in the case, there are times where you'll get records that show the location of the incoming call, but it always, it makes that clear. Basically, you have the incoming call and the location of the receiving call. You wouldn't have a situation where you only have one. That's what he says. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But what I think we can say for certain is, no one can say with any definitiveness what the distinction is between these. I think that's the first thing. The second thing, everyone agrees that outgoing calls are accurate for location data. So to the extent we have outgoing calls, they are accurate for location data. Which means, number three, when someone tells you that the the cell phone records are useless or unreliable or can't be trusted or aren't good evidence at all, they are wrong, period. End of story. They are wrong. The cell phone records are useful for all sorts of things, and they're absolutely useful for location data, at least when it comes to outgoing calls. And if you believe the cast expert, they're useful for incoming calls as well. So there you have it. There you have it. And there you have it. With that, Alice, essentially that ends our presentation on the evidence in this case, which leaves only one thing to do. And that is to talk theories. about theories. But theories. I've decided nobody likes theories, so this is the end of We're our ad coverage. We're not yeah, going to do theories. Goodbye, everybody. You know, what I've heard from everybody is you just want to hear the evidence. You don't want any bias. You don't want any theories, anything. So that's it. You guys discuss. Let us know what you think. Who did it? Who didn't do it? I don't know. It's been great. Next week on the prosecutors, we're going to talk about a new. I'm just, I'm kidding, of course. We're going to do <laughs> theories. We're going to do theories. Probably going to do two episodes on theories because it's. You a know lot. that would be a great clapback, though. Like you don't <laughs> yeah. want to bias. Yeah. You don't want to bias yeah. response. That we're not going to. We're not yeah. going to tie it in a pretty Good bow luck. for you. You can theorize all you want. You There's the evidence. evidence. Go for it. Run. Take <laughs> no, off. We, instead of theories, we should just read the entire trial transcript. There you go. There you go. <laughs> we'll just read both closing arguments and let you decide. <laughs> yeah so oh, gosh. next week we are going to start with theories when finish with theories we'll do both theories episodes next week it would just it'd be just like us to make you wait a week for the second half of the theories but we're not going to do that we'll do them both in one week so you can hear them and who, who knows? knows who knows <laughs> can't wait to to get those out there and hear what everybody thinks look 
this is one of those episodes which is going to be controversial because people talk about this all the time. So I'm looking forward to hearing about why we're wrong about incoming calls, why we're wrong about the things we think are absolutely not in dispute. If you want to dispute those things, let us have it. Dispute away. But I want you to do it from a position of expertise. Like, give me some reason to believe it. And it's going to be hard for you because... Unless you can point to something that's happened in a courtroom, I'm not going to be that likely to credit what you're saying over what the actual expert, the guy who testified for the defense at the Boston Marathon bombing, said when he was testifying for Adnan. I'm going with that as being the official defense position, so I need you to bring me something like that if you want to sort of try and push us off this position. But can't wait to hear it. At Prosecutors Pod for all your social media, prosecutorspod at gmail.com. Thank you to everybody watching on YouTube. Everybody who is with us tonight in the chat room, early and ad free. Actually, it wasn't ad free because you listened to us record ads earlier. So thank you but for that. But it was that. a hilarious ad full episode. Absolutely. 100%. So thank you guys so much for all of your support. Well, Alice, do you want to do some questions? Can't wait. We for have questions. been building up questions. You guys have responded Woo! like crazy. We got a one star review complaining about how duplicitous it was of us getting people <laughs> to ask questions in our five star reviews because that's driving people to leave five star reviews. Yes. How dare? Yes, how dare person. that? It does. And I'm not answering your question because you didn't leave a five star review. Sorry. <laughs> You'll just have to always wonder as you hate uh, listen. Okay. Oh my but we got goodness. tons of questions. Tons of questions. So thank you guys. If you don't know, if you leave a five star review, on apple we will answer a question for you if you leave it somewhere else like let us know you did it because i hardly ever yeah, see i was like, also i was also gonna say like i you know i i wish the the critique from the one star review was like you're you're actually working for apple and you're trying to get everyone to only listen on apple podcasts oh that'll be next <laughs> that'll be next absolutely okay. we all know that brett won't do that okay i'm gonna ask this one we'll start off with an easy one that's kind of hard this is from sls Texas Pete, Louisiana, Cholula, or Tabasco. So what is it, Alice? What is your... This, of all the things we've talked about today, this will be the most controversial. What is your favorite hot sauce? So I make my own? Is that not a Texas oh, response wow, or there you what? go. Look at that. I actually make my own. Uh, you have to grow your own peppers and you have to make response. your own because you got to bring <laughs> the heat. <laughs> now, there are a lot of like Texas seasonings that I still get shipped in from H-E-B in Texas because I don't live there anymore. H-E-B is a grocery store like a Kroger or a Publix, but it is a Texas-based grocery store and they have some of the best seasonings and products and they have like a tortilla machine where they make tortillas fresh and they have the best basically products they don't sponsor us by the way <laughs> ever and when i go to texas i bring back like an entire duffel bag of fresh tortillas like out of the tortilla machine and i get home and they're still hot and different seasonings but i don't bring back hot sauce because i buy the ingredients there to make my own hot sauce so wow. that's just the truth so everybody's going to want the recipe, Alice, so you're going to have to share that. If you want to share it on Maybe Patreon. Maybe I'll make I some can... bring it to CrimeCon. Oh, there you go. I love we'll, it. Oh, we'll get some tortilla chips. We'll just like burn our mouths off and have some Topo Chico. People, That'll be delicious. People have been eating your tofu recipe. Have they I've really? I've gotten a lot of people I, who've, who've pointed that out. I made it tonight, in fact, and my kids like clapped Did they? along with the HelloFresh. I'm not kidding. Like we had HelloFresh <laughs> and we also had tofu because I make tofu for lunch because I've had this conversation. You know, I don't want like meat going bad in the lunchbox. So I make tofu. So I made it tonight to pack for lunch tomorrow and they, they like were eating it like snacks. Did they gobble it up? They gobbled it up there you go. <laughs> along with the firecracker meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, well, I'm not even going to answer that question because Alice has killed it. I was always, I always liked Tabasco sauce, but I'm, you know, I'm basic that way. So okay. that's not basic. That's not basic at well, all. Good. But I will teach you how to make. Like, also, I make my own guacamole, and I'm not going to lie. Like, my guacamole is pretty darn good. And if you put a little bit of that hot sauce on there, whew, it's something else. Mm. Anyways, now I'm just getting hungry. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's let's disabuse Daryl here of his... He says, why can jurors take notes during a trial but not actually use the notes during deliberations? Well, it is not the case. 
that you can't use them. It's just that different jurisdictions have different rules about these kind of things. So in, in jurisdictions that allow you to take notes, there's always an instruction the judge will give, which is like, if your memory conflicts with your notes, go with your memory because your notes aren't evidence, basically. So there, some judges are really nervous about that. I think in, even in the, the Murdoch trial, the judge didn't let them take notes for that reason. He wanted them to be focused. I mean, I will say, in my experience, you want people taking notes. And, and you can imagine why, right, trying to listen and write at the same time, they don't want you to be transcribing, and you're not going to be able to transcribe at the rate at which someone is speaking. And there's so much going on in the courtroom. Your notes, even if you think you're taking complete notes, may not be fully complete. You're, if you take notes the way I do, especially in court, while like a witness is going, I write one word. And then like a day later, I'll be like, man, what did that one word mean? Like, what does it mean when I say saucy? <laughs> I have no idea. Is that good or bad? <laughs> and so the point is, you were there. You were their first person. The primary source is really your memory. And your notes can aid you in that. And we don't know how you take notes. So we can't tell you how to interpret your notes. Maybe you're a fantastic note taker and you take notes all the time and you know exactly what your keywords are and they call back things precisely in your mind or you're someone who never takes notes so when you write things down it's not really a good representation and now you're trying to create a memory to fit your notes and you don't want that to happen you want people to go off based on their memories so it's just trying to kind of equalize it and basically say like there's no right answer in your notes so don't stare so intently at your notes draw back into your memory of what you heard and what was going on. There's so much more than what was said, right? There are the mannerisms, the pauses before someone answers a question, the looks on their faces, their grunts, their the rolling of eyes. There's so much more than just words. And people tend to just take down notes about words. And the thing about having a testifier is that you have to use all of your senses to take in what that person is saying, not just the actual words coming out of their mouths. So L. Kelly 01 will answer this one and, and call today. How did you two meet and when did you actually become friends? We met when we auditioned to be on a podcast together. Yeah, exactly. This <laughs> just is, kidding. This is all a big corporate <laughs> sponsored thing. <laughs> we tricked well, you this whole I, time. I will I will say, I remember when I realized that Sync wasn't like a group of five guys who were best friends and grew up together on a <laughs> cul-de-sac together and like just all happened to be great singers. When I mm. realized that they were like a corporate, you know, like they auditioned for it, it kind of hurt a little bit. Breaks I still love them. Yeah. Okay. You, you want to answer well, I mean, that? Basically, maybe, maybe we have different answers. I don't know how we could have different answers. We don't have different answers at all. <laughs> yeah, so it was a while ago. It's been years now. But basically, I had this project I was doing, and I didn't really want anybody else on it. And then one of my friends emailed me and was like, hey, you should really have this person on your project. And I was like, another person. And I looked at the resume, and I was like, <laughs> okay, fine, whatever. And I took it to my boss, and I said, do you want this person? And he said, Sure. So then that's how I met Alice. And it turned out that was a great decision because Alice, as you know, is a ray of sunshine. And and I was very morose and stressed and <laughs> and all sorts of other things that entire time. And whenever I'd see Alice walking down the hallway, she would just be like beaming. And and then we finished that project and I asked Alice to stay and work work with me. And, and she said, no, I'm going somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is so history. basically I paid you back when you were like, I don't want to work with this girl, Alice. All she does is smile. Yep. So what I remember from meeting you first is like, if I remember this correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like our team was very small and it was all men but me. Am I right about that? That's right. Like our core group. Yep. Our core group was all men because I remember you guys Hello. all knew each other and you were all like Harvard buddies and like yep. I'm the one outlier who didn't go to Harvard <laughs> and I would walk into like y'all made your own little, you know, like in college when I, at least this is what my experience was in college like a bunch of the guys they'd be like why should we all be in different rooms we should all push our beds together and all have one sleep room so we'll have like five game rooms and we'll, you know that's basically what brett and his friends did they were like why should we all have different offices with desks we should all like slam ourselves into one room so that it smells kind of like that old room pizza. Was nasty it was nasty. Nobody cleaned that room. Like, seriously, they, the ladies who took out the trash did not come into that room because it was a like a hazard. And so the trash never got taken out in this room. So it smelled and they all sat there and they like, you know, wore the same clothes every day because it was a really intense project and nobody went home. And I was the weirdo who like decided to stay in my own office and take out my trash. And I was like, oh, I'm never going to like 
be part of the group. And I was like kind of sad when I first started, but then we all became like best friends. So it all worked out for the best, but that's what I remember. I don't remember you. Mm. I remember like mm. a gaggle of guys. It's me right here. <laughs> and I found- <laughs> You were just another guy to me. <laughs> I, sh- I don't remember when that was, but I actually found the email from our mutual friend, who now is also a podcaster, as a matter of fact, who uh, sent me That's your true. resume, and I forwarded it to you. There there you go. I, oh, it, we go back so far. So far. So far. Yeah. yeah. And that was so fun. We had a lot fun. of fun. It was fun. Man, there were like midnight deliveries, and yeah, I didn't know you, you that and I well. Were, we did that midnight thing. It was like 2 o'clock in the yeah, morning. Where you left me, I did and leave you took you. the keys. It's true. Like, I did leave the keys. In the middle of the night. Yeah. I did. <laughs> I was really you scared. Were safe, I was like, Someone's though. gonna. It was fine. I mean, I didn't was think it would I, take I so long. It took a lot longer than I thought it was. It I took a really long time. time. You were sitting in the yeah, car, kn- and it was beeping at you because the keys were out. Sorry about that. Yeah, because you took the keys. I couldn't even like run yeah. if someone came to like attack me. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyways, anyways, you know, from from the fire, we forged a great friendship. <laughs> we did. We did. And worked together for a long time until Alice moved on to bigger and better <sighs> things. And I still so. miss you to this day. It's only been like a couple months. <laughs> and I get to see you all the time now. On the I screen do actually get to see you. And this is great. This, which we is another reason also, I like doing the live, you know, the live uh, recordings because I actually get to see your face. I mean, I enjoyed <laughs> I, the cell phone thing was easy. It was easy to do it that way. Mm-hmm. But this is much nicer. So this this is true. This is true. Well, great question. That was a great question. I do want to say last night we had the great, great, great honor of appearing. I mean, I guess we haven't appeared yet, but we recorded with Jason Blair and hopefully that will be coming out soon. It will, by the time you guys hear this, it will already be out. So I hope you'll, you'll check that out. I think it's going to end up being two episodes because we can't shut up that we're going to be on Silver Linings Handbook with Jason Blair. So we're looking forward to it. We already did it, so we're looking forward to it coming out. But as I said, you guys will have it available, so look that up and let us know what you think. Well, Alice, is there anything else you want to add before we sign off? Oh, so much, but we better save the fire for the theories or not theories. How about we have a vote? We have a Twitter vote to see if people want to hear our theories. <laughs> there you go. So you guys better show up for the vote. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise we'll just move Other straight on to Tupac. star people. It's all about Tupac. <laughs> all Tupac all the time now, so... You know, uh, anyway, that would actually be fun. That would be fun. Okay, guys. Well, this has been awesome. We've enjoyed this. We will see you next week where we will be talking about theories, whatever the outcome of the Twitter vote. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. What case do you guys want us to do next? Do y'all want us to keep doing these when the add-on's over? Because we only got the two lives. more add-on episodes. How many people are here right now? Again, I can't. It won't let me. It won't let me log in for some reason. We had like 150 at the height. That's a lot of people on like a nighttime. Like I actually have to go and do work after this. Ugh. Mm. That sucks. <laughs> You're like you chose your life. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to bed. Because I work for the government. <laughs> oh, my Mandy. goodness. West Memphis 3. Yeah, we're going to follow up ad now with West Memphis 3. We're trying to get rid of all our fans.
<laughs> we're trying to get rid all. of all our fans. We're trying yeah. to just set the the true crime world on fire. By fire, I mean to burn ourselves down. <laughs> it's always funny when people post what people say on the gallery, and they're like, "I'm so enraged. I am filled <laughs> with rage by these podcasts." It's like, okay, man. <laughs> Like, I don't know what you want. I don't know. Like, you don't I have don't to agree know. with this. I don't really understand. Like, look, we I, told you I what the defense it. and the prosecution said tonight. You can pick which one you think is more convincing. I know. I know. We've given you <laughs> both sides. That's the thing. Blockbusters are streaming free this month during Popcorn Summer Movies on Pluto TV. Watch Django Unchained or Transformers Dark of the Moon for an action-packed evening or The Truman Show and School of Rock for a good laugh with the whole family. Plus, Pluto TV has thousands of other free movies available on live and on demand.